Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6. Now, if you were with us last week, we uh, started this brief sermon series called What God Can't Do, and I heard Ben and Don did a really great job encouraging us. I, I thought it was funny, for example, that we had the old tough guy, Don, talking about the love of God. We had the, the nice guy, Ben, talking about how God can't ignore sin, and and, I, and it was just uh, a challenging service. If you did not get a chance to see it, it's online. Make sure you pick it up. Uh, but before we go any further, just so that, you know, I don't get texted at or messaged or anything like that, we know that God can do everything. We know God can do anything. In fact, if you came Tuesday night, I made the case that God is, is om omnipresent, omnipowerful. He is all-powerful. He can do anything, but... He has voluntarily chosen to limit his power. And so the more accurate title to this sermon series would be What God Won't Do. But God, what God can't do gets your attention, causes you to think, causes you to ponder, and that's why we chose that. And so we saw last week that what? We saw three things that God, first of all, cannot lie. God cannot lie to us. How do we know that? Titus 1-2 says, God never tells a lie. You can take that to the bank, that God cannot, will not lie to us. And that means this. That means you can trust His Word. That means that you can build your life upon the Bible. That means if the Bible says do it, you should do it. If the Bible says don't do it, you shouldn't do it. And if the Bible don't care, you shouldn't care either. I am amazed. How many people try to add things to the Bible like there's not enough rules in the Bible to begin with? How about this? How about you stick, you trust, you obey, you believe the Word of God as it is written, and then we won't worry about all that other stuff. Why? Because God cannot lie, but man sure will. And so we love the fact that God cannot lie to us. But notice, secondly, uh, this is a Donism that God cannot not love us. God cannot not love us. And I know... I had a lady walk up to me Tuesday nights. That's a double negative. I get it. It may be a double, double negative, but it is a wonderful positive when it comes to God's Word. That God cannot help but love us. That He is love. And Jeremiah 31, 3 says, The Lord said, I love you with an everlasting love. Underline that word everlasting. What does it mean? That means He loved you before you were born. He loved Logan now. He loves you after you die. God loves you with an everlasting love. But notice thirdly, these two must go together. We see that God cannot ignore our sin. God cannot ignore our sin. Now, why is this important? Because there seems to be a bastardization of Scripture right now that tries to sit there and say that true love doesn't notice flaws. True love doesn't notice sin. True love doesn't notice mistakes. That is contrary to what the Word of God says. You do understand that real love forces you to con confront and deal with the flaws and the, the problems and the mistakes of your beloved. How do I know this? Why? Because Numbers 14, 18 says, The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. There's that love again. Forgiving every kind of sin. But, underline that word but. Circle the word but. What have you got to do to make it jump out at you? But he does not excuse the guilty. And so that's why I've always said that true love is somebody that sees us warts and all and chooses to love us anyway. And that's what God does for us. He cannot lie. He cannot not love us, but he also cannot ignore our sins. And maybe, just maybe, his love compelling him not to ignore your sin is why you are experiencing frustration, heartache, and despair right now. Because he's given you every chance in the world to deal with your sin. To deal with the lying, to deal with the deception, to deal with the lust, to deal with the fear, to deal with the doubt. He's given you every chance in the world to deal with it, and you won't deal with it. And God's like, all right, if you won't deal with it, I will. That's what good dads do. And so, is there anything else that God can't do? Is there something else that, that God can't do? Well, read with me, if you would, in Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. 
And we see Jesus is going home. He is experiencing homecoming. We drove by a church this morning and had homecoming today. And he was going to his homecoming today. And notice what he says in Mark chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Jesus left that part of the country, returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue or the church. And many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed, he's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and his brothers, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in Jesus. And then Jesus told them this phrase that we've heard many times in our life. A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he could not do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. I'm here to tell you, today, God is amazed at our unbelief. You're saying, Randy, what's that got to do with what God can't do? Well, look at your sheet. We see, first of all, that God cannot show his power for us without faith. God cannot show his power for Andrew, for Jennifer, without faith faith. He cannot show his power for us without faith. Mark 6, 5 says this. Go back to it. It says, because of their unbelief, Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. I know what some of you are thinking because I thought it too when I first read that. Wasn't healing some sick people a miracle? Wasn't that in and of itself a miracle? Well, let me give you what he's talking about when he says the word miracle. Let me give you the definition of miracle. It comes from the Greek word dunamis. It says, it means might, power, and strength. And so when he talks about miracles, he's talking about things that require a lot of might, power, and strength. Now that word is different than the word for heal in our verse, which is comes from the Greek word therapeuo, which indicates that Jesus cared for them as a physician or doctor. And so basically what our verse was saying is, is this, rather than being able to blow their world away, rather than be able to radically change their life, rather than be able to show his power and his might, like walking on water, feeding 5,000, rather than doing great and awesome and amazing things in their life, all Jesus could do was in today's language, all he could do was give them some Tylenol and some allergy meds. That's all he could. And guess what? Most healers could do that back then. And so because of their unbelief, Jesus was not able to show his might, show his power, show his strength. Now, note the word miracles in verse 5. It's the root word for our word dynamite. And because they refused to faith, because they refused to believe, Jesus was not able to blow up their ordinary average life. Jesus wasn't able to kapow their lives with awesome power. He couldn't change the course of their future. Sounds like most churches today. We come in, we take our spiritual Tylenol, we we take our spiritual allergy meds, and we go back out, and our lives are no different. There's no change in us, and there's no difference with us between anybody else. Most people look at church today and say, why should I go? What difference does it make? And that leads us to the fact, and the fact is this. Our unbelief robs us of so much awesomeness. Our unbelief robs us of so much awesomeness. You see, we're like the people in Deuteronomy 1, 32. It says, even after all God did, you refused to trust the Lord your God. You're saying, what has God done for me? Well, let's, let's talk about the historical biggies, what I call them. Let's think about Easter. Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and mine. He died on the cross for the whole world's sin. He died so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Then he rose again so that we can experience the fullness of life that he's given us. Let's think about Christmas. Christmas is God becoming one of us. God be, being born of a virgin. God doing incredible and amazing things at that first Christmas. Let's think about the Bible. We've been talking about this a lot on Tuesday night. What God has had to do to preserve that copy of the Bible that you have in your hand. That it is the reliable word of God. Why? Because God has miraculously taken it. He has miraculously protected it. He has kept it. And we can trust the word of God because of the miracles that God has done when it comes to the Bible. And even after all of that, we still refuse to trust the Lord our God. You say, I don't believe in all that stuff, so who cares? But what about lately? How about Hurricane Florence? You do realize I can take you to a place that I live that whole houses, bottom floors, are underwater. Is your house dry? 
Is your car okay? How about this? Why don't we just think about dangerous traffic? One of the things that God does for me every once in a while is he makes me look at the people that are coming up 49. I have to go to Ramsor a lot, just get, went that way today. And he makes me look at people coming up my way. And you would be amazed, 30 to 40% of them, as they're passing me, are looking at their phone. They're not even looking at the road. And yet God in his grace and his mercy and our protective angelic host keep us safe in the midst of this crazy traffic. How about your clumsy kids? I've got godchildren and, and children of the faith all over. I am amazed that they are still alive. They stumble, they bumble, they rumble. It is amazing why they haven't hit their head on a corner and just died on the spot. I am more amazed that more children don't die than children who do die. Why? Because we got some clumsiness in our family. And yet God has taken care of us through it all. And even after all of that, we still don't trust his power. You're saying, Randy, I do trust God's power. No, you don't. You want to know if you trust God's power? Look at Matthew 17, 20. It says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing, underline that word, nothing. Nothing would be impossible. You see, if our faith, had truly connected us to God's power, then our lives would be marked by miracles. If our faith, if your faith had connected to God's power, then that mountain that's in your way would be gone. But we still got mountains, don't we? We still got problems, don't we? Our lives is not any more affected by miracles than somebody who's never darkened the church door. You see, this is what I want for you. Many of you know that, that I've made a, it wouldn't be radical back in the old part of the Bible. In fact, in the old part of the Bible, I would be considered a light giver. But many of you know that I have, I have decided to faith God with my finances. And because it's 2018, 18%, not of my net, but 18% of my gross. If it comes into my bank account, I give 18% of it to the Lord. And not too long ago, I was sitting at my computer. And you don't understand how many people are paid by me. They're responsible. I'm responsible to pay them. And I was literally sitting at my computer going, what are we going to do? What's come in? Because you see, I got to pay people whether I get paid or not. I owe them. And I'm sitting there going, I'm $1,500 short. I am $1,500 away from being able to pay my payroll. And I'm sitting at my computer, and I am rubbing the, you wonder why I'm bald? I'm always rubbing my head, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to stimulate the brain cells. What do I do to pay these people? And I'd already decided, you know what? All right, I'm just going to do with that. I am not going to eat this. I'm, oodles and noodles. Chicken noodle soup. Not the fancy kind, not the progresso. We ain't doing progresso. We're doing the 67 cent kind. And I'd already decided that's what I was going to do. And then it came a knock on the door at that moment. And literally somebody walks in and plops 15 $100 bills in my lap. I just start crying. You're saying, right? What's the... Think about this for a second. For somebody to give me $1,500, that means God had to give them $15,000. And for... Th that's a miracle in and of itself. And then he had to give them the, the desire to give it to me. And then think about it. He had to work it out where all of that took place, where the same moment I'm sitting at my computer going, oh, God, how am I going to pay payroll? A knock comes at my door. Have you thought about that? It was a miracle. God showed his power in my life. You're saying, Randy, does God want to do that for me? Is that how God wants me to live? Well, look at your sheep. The truth is this. God wants to share his power with us. God wants to share his power with us. Go back to Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. It says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for, underline that word for, for us who believe him. There's that word believe again. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. 
And from the beginning of this thing called Christianity, from the beginning of our faith, God has been trying to give his power away to people. You're saying, Randy, why would he want that? Why would he do something that's crazy as that? That same power that raised Jesus from the dead? Well, no wonder mountains can move. No wonder nothing would be impossible. If you could raise somebody from the dead, you could do anything. And that's the power that God wants to give to you today. He wants to give you the power to love somebody that doesn't love you back. He wants to give you the power to forgive those and get that crap off your back. He wants to give you the power to do amazing things. You say, why? Why? So that we'll make him look good and people will get saved. Notice what 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12 says. It says, we keep praying for you, asking God to give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then, I don't like that word then, then the name of the Lord Jesus will be glorified because of the way you live. You see, God gives us the power so that we can point people to him. Think about this for a second. Just this one little example. Bruce and I were talking this week about, do you have enemies? Remember what a definition of enemy is. Somebody that's trying to hurt you. Somebody that's trying to hurt your kids. Somebody that's trying to hurt your pocketbook. Somebody that's trying to hurt your country. Somebody that's trying to hurt your community. That's an enemy. You got enemies? Because I'm firmly convinced that the closer you get to Jesus, the more enemies that you will have. And some of you are looking around right now saying, I ain't got no enemies. That tells me something about your walk with Jesus. But think about, we get enemies, and then what does God tell us to do? Love them. Pray for them. Why? You do realize the Bible teaches that all of humanity is born an enemy of God. And when we show love to our enemies... It reveals to a lost and dying world that God loves them even though they're his enemies as well. And so here's my question for you. Is your faith connecting you to God's incredible power? As you flip your notes over, are are mountains being moved in your life so that, that God looks good? Why? Because God cannot show us his powers without faith. But notice, secondly, The second thing that God cannot do today is God cannot get tired. God cannot get tired. Isaiah 40, 28 says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. What does he mean by weary? The definition of weary is to gasp for air, to get winded, to run out of energy, to wilt. You you get an example? Have you seen anybody walk upstairs lately? They get weary, right? They're like, (laughs) well, guess what? The Bible says that God can't do that. That God can't get weary of you. God can't get weary of us. God can't get weary in his power. He can't get weary. He can't get tired. He cannot. But guess what? Isaiah 42, 4 says God won't give up or quit. But that's not us, is it? Oh, no. We get tired. Heard somebody say it this week. I'm tired to the bone. Well, here's the problem with getting tired to the bone. It leads to this unfortunate fact. And the fact is this. Our tiredness is often used as an excuse to sin. Our tiredness is often used as an excuse to sin. Whether it be our kids, whether it be our friends, whether it be ourselves, we love to use tiredness. How many times have you heard some crazy mama say, oh, they're just tired. No, your kid just stabbed me in the eye with a pen. They're not tired. They're evil. They're just tired. They took a Benadryl. They're just still sleepy. No! We love to use not just, you know why we do it for our kids? Because we love to do it ourselves. I had a guy sin against me, sin against this church, sin against the preschool. And then he get a, I get a text later on. Oh, Randy, I'm sorry for doing that. I shouldn't have done that. But I'm so tired. What are we doing? 
We love to use our tiredness as an excuse to do wicked and evil things. We're just like Elijah in 1 Kings 19.4. It says, Elijah walked for a whole day into the desert. He sat down under a bush, and he asked to die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. He prayed, let me die. Now, before you feel sorry for Elijah, you do understand not just earlier, he had experienced the power and the might of God. This son of a gun called down fire from heaven. He blew up the offering. He'd just been victorious over 400 demon-worshiping priests. And then some silly little girl threatens him. And what does he do? He chooses to walk a day into the desert. Now, let's be honest. If any of us walked a day in the desert, would we get tired? Absolutely. We're human. That's what we do. But guess what? He then used his tiredness that came as a result of his choices to, as an excuse to quit obeying God. He just gave up. He just quit. And oh my goodness, we do the same thing. Trust me, God broke me in half this week. Many of you know that I hurt my back Tuesday. I mean, when I say I hurt my back, this tells you how bad your back's hurting. When you go to sit down and take a poop, and then you say, nope, I'm not going to do that because it hurt too much to go like this, I'll just do that later. That's how bad I was hurting. I couldn't tie my shoes. It hurt to sleep. It hurt to walk. It hurt to preach. It hurt to do everything. How about Friday? getting a little weary. I was tired of hurting. And I allowed my tiredness as an excuse to be irritable with my family. You're saying, Randy, I understand. That's, that's, that's okay. No, it's not. The Bible says love is not irritable. It doesn't say love is not irritable when it's not tired. No, it says love is not irritable. And so whether I hurt or not, whether I was tired or not, it was not an excuse to be irritable. You see, we love to use our tiredness that we create, by the way. By the way, I hurt my own back. Nobody made me. Huh? Nobody said, Randy, you got to pick up that 250 pounds. It was me. I made the choice. And because I made the choice, I then used it as an excuse to be ugly to somebody else. By the way, I'm not the only one. God has clearly said in his word, hey, idiot, take a Sabbath. You know what that means? That means one day a week, you do not do your normal labors. If you are a modern woodman salesman, you do not sell once a week. If you work for learning environments, that means one day a week, you do nothing with learning environments. If you are a speech therapist, that means one day a week, you do not do speech therapy. If you direct a freaking preschool, one day a week, you don't do preschool. And we neglect our Sabbath. We make the choices to make ourselves tired. And then we use that tiredness as an excuse to sin against somebody else. But here's the thing. It doesn't have to be that way. Why? Because of this truth. The truth is this. God wants to give us his endurance. God wants to give us his endurance. Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. See, God's offering you and I his perseverance, his strength. He's offering that to us. But what's the condition? Look at your sheet. The condition is we must trust him. You're saying, Randy, I hear that word trust all the time. What does it mean to trust? Well, notice what Psalm 119.2 says. Blessed are those who obey God. They trust in him with all their hearts. What's he saying? Then right out beside that, obedience equals trust. If you are not obeying the scriptures, stop lying to yourself and saying that you trust God. The test of our, 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 test of our trust is God's obedience. So obedience equals trust. And if we obey God, if we trust God, then he promises to give us his stamina, his perseverance, his endurance. Let me tell you how you know that. Think back to when you don't get tired. Have you ever noticed there are times in your life that you do a lot, but that you don't get tired? Have you noticed when? I'll go ahead and give you a clue. It's when you're doing what God made you to do. You, it's when you're doing what God wants you to do. When you're doing what God wants you to do, you're living a life of obedience and trust. 
you don't get tired. When I'm walking with the Lord and I'm obeying Him and listening to His voice throughout the day, I do not get weary. Why? Because look at what Jesus says, Matthew eleven thirty: The load I give you to carry is light. So here's my question for you today. Are you living a life of trust in God? You say, I don't know. Your tiredness reveals the truth. Your tiredness reveals the truth. Why? Because God cannot bless us with power without faith. Notice, secondly, God cannot get tired. But notice, thirdly, this is good news. God cannot lose. God cannot lose. Proverbs 21, 31 says this, the Lord will always win. What's he saying? The Bible reveals that that part of God being God means that losing is impossible for him. Now, I know what some of you are thinking because you understand that this thing called Christianity, to be a Christian means to be like God, to be like Jesus, to be like Christ. And you're sitting there saying, Randy, I love God. I follow God. I try to be like Jesus. I try to be like Christ. How come I am constantly defeated? How come I'm defeated by worry, defeated by fear, defeated by lust, defeated by gluttony? Randy, why am I constantly defeating when I'm trying to follow after God? Notice the fact. The fact is this. Our pride leads to our defeat. Our pride leads to our defeat. Why? Because Jeremiah 50, 31 says, I am your enemy, you arrogant people, says the Lord. What's he saying? Our prideful arrogance causes the undefeated God to fight against us. Think about it. Every time you are, you are defeated by anger, every time you are defeated by fear, every time you're defeated by doubt, lust, gluttony, whatever, every time you're defeated, you need to look for pride. For example, right now, some of you are defeated in your finances. You need to start looking over your finances to find the prideful selfishness and rebellion. I guarantee you there's something in your finances that God told you not to buy and you bought it anyway. There is rebellion in your finances if you are being defeated. If you are not a, if you are not living in victory today financially, it's because there's prideful selfishness and rebellion in your life. You see, some of you are going, but no, Randy, it's the devil. The devil's beating me. The devil's attacking me. No, it's God. Why? Because James 4, 6 says God opposes the proud. But he favors the humble. You do understand you can give 10% all you want to, but if you are prideful about the other 90%, God opposes you. You can come to church on Sunday all you want to, but if you're prideful the other six days of the week, God opposes you. You want to know why you stink? You want to know why you're losing? You want to know why you're the captain of the Loserville team? You want to know why? Because of your pride. But is there any good news? Yes, notice this truth. The truth is this. God wants to turn our losses into victory. God wants to turn our losses into victory. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, I thank God who always leads us in victory because of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Father God gives us the victory, underline that word the, the victory because of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because of what Jesus did on the cross, God can turn our losses into victory. You're saying, but Randy, I was prideful. It, my pride is what led to my defeat. Well, guess what? We know because of the cross that God reminds us that he can turn even the worst victory, defeat into one of our greatest victories. You know, people are always wanting the simple answer to things. And what I found is that the simple answer to why your pastor is divorced is because my first wife committed numerous affairs. That's the simple answer. What you might not know is that, guess what? I have counseled with numerous marriages. I have counseled with numerous couples. Adultery and infidelity is rampant. It happens all the time. And yet they don't get divorced. And so while the simple answer to why I am divorced is because my first wife committed adultery. But here's the real reason. The real reason is because I responded 
far too often with pride that God's like, here you go. You see, the ultimate reason is because in my pride, I decided that there were certain things that I wasn't going to say to my ex-wife that needed to be said. There were certain things that I needed to do to bring consequences, to bring pain, to, to provide motivation, to change them from doing bad. I refused to do. In my pride, I said to a holy God, God, I will obey you in regards to everything else, but I will not obey you because when it comes to her. I am a jealous God. Do you not know that I am a consuming fire? And I will burn your life to the ground just so that you will know that I'm all you need. I spent 18 years in my own power, in my own strength, trying to save my marriage. The day of the divorce came, and I failed epically. But you know what I did? Rather than blame her, I went to the Lord, and I got down on my knees, and I said, God, it's not her fault. It's me. And God, I need you to change me and fix me. And humble me. God, I am not a humble man. But if you will humble me, I will walk in that humility. And you know what that son of a gun done? He has changed the day of my greatest defeat into one of my most beautiful blessings. Why? Look at your sheep. James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in So my question for you today is this. Are you willing to humble yourself before God today? Will you let him lead you to victory? Oh, bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bowed, every eye closed. I was just listening to a guy on the radio talking about how every morning he woke up said, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs. Today's the day that I quit. And for 15 years, every day, he figured out a reason to drink. He figured out a reason to do drugs. He said it got so bad that near the end, he literally would not look at himself in the mirror because he realized how pathetic worthless and how sinful he was. I don't know about you, but I can empathize with that. For years, I lived my life in defeat. For years, sin owned me. And so if that's you, can I ask you a question? Are you ready to receive God's victory over sin in your life? 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says the victory, the victory he's talking about is victory over sin and the death we deserve because of it. Are you ready? Then it's going to take, it's, it's going to require you to humble yourself before a mighty God and call out to him and ask him to save you. It's amazing how often this verse is true. When we humble ourselves, God lifts us up. He lifts us out of the death and destruction that we deserve. So I wonder, are you ready to receive it? You're saying, yeah, Randy, I'm ready. What do I need to do? The Bible says you need to call upon the name of the Lord. You need to cry out to Him. You need to humble yourself and ask Him to save. You're saying, Randy, I don't know how to talk to God. I don't know how to talk to Him. What do I say? Well, in just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer with me, Say, how do you know? This is a prayer that I pray. And God gave me the victory. 
so would you pray with me? You're saying, Randy, do I need to pray out loud? Yeah. I don't want you to forget this. I want this to be real. So would you pray with me out loud? Would you just pray? I'm getting ready to pray. As I pray this prayer, will you pray this prayer with me to God? Would you just pray? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I pray. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me, then guess what? The power that created this universe has just moved in your life. The awesome God of forgiveness and grace has just brought you a new heart, a new life. That's good news to share with somebody. So I want to encourage you. If you prayed that prayer with me today for the first time, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, tell somebody. There's somebody out there that needs to hear what God has done for you today. Well, let me pray for you. Dear God, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord God, that you're still saving sinners today. I thank you, Lord God, that you're still giving us victory today. And Lord, I just ask that you'll be with those who who prayed that prayer with me, whether it's online or whether it's here in the sanctuary. Lord God, I pray that you'll give them the courage, the joy, the excitement to tell somebody what happened to them. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake.